hear me? Uh, yeah, my talk's on NIST risk management framework and why you should utilize it. Uh, Rushan or Andrew Hall, and my Twitter channel is at Rushan underscore double E. Okay, so who I am? I'm an electrical engineer that speaks a little bit Chinese. I minored in it. Uh, I have my CISSP and a CNS 4016, which is in risk management. I deal with risk management framework in my current job. I can't mention my company or what I do for this. Uh, I like to design and build electronic badges for DC81. I made the party badge last year, making the party badge this year. We might get into some of that later in the talk if we get into it. Uh, I participate in DC81, Utah SEC, Utah SANE activities when possible. Kind of in the community, been doing this for a few years. First time talking. So the outline of my talk, I'll pretty much go over what is NIST and the RMF, uh, key points of the NIST 800 series documents which cover RMF, uh, how businesses can utilize RMF, kind of help talk about how risk can be utilized throughout the organization, um, some of the RMF principles, how it can help security, and have, if we have time, we'll have some questions, Q&A. So let's go into it. What is NIST and RMF? NIST is from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They provide many of the standards that are based that the government and industry uses for different things. They started going through and making up guidelines and basis through the 800 series, and they also have the 1800 series. Other special publications that they go through. RMF is a method for the government to standardize on a security control mythology. In the past, they, they had DITSCAP, DIACAP, and they were all over the place through different organizations. So they try to standardize it, and it's going into RMF. And RMF standardizes it across the government as a whole, and also helps make it so different organizations speak a common language, which is kind of nice. Uh, so it goes through government-centric methods for security, and some of it doesn't actually go into too much detail. It's kind of overarching guidelines in some of the publications, while other ones go into more control base and get a little bit deeper on guidance and their documentation. Uh, so RMF is the management of organizational risk of operating the system. Risk should be a driving method for organizations to assess their operational security. Risk is a key thing for any organization to be focused on. It's not, because that's a place where the C-suite all the way down to your general employee will usually understand what risk is and how to mitigate it in some way. So if you speak a common language on risk, you can be able to communicate ideas and appropriate assets appropriately to determine what risk is most beneficial to, to be going after and not waste resources on a minor risk, well, bigger ones over kind of lurking that you're kind of not aware of in other areas. And it provides a standard that the systems engineers, uh, it's cut off, uh, can go through. See my slides go too fast. Okay. So we get into, integrate into the system engineering life cycle. I'm not too sure if you guys are familiar with the system engineering life cycle. Basic diagrams up there. It's basically from inception to grave for a device. If you go through engineering, it goes through all of your trade studies at the beginning. Assets, allocating funds, you get into development. You get into the requirements, which are key points, especially within RMF. You get into the requirements of the system, and the sooner it's probably the, the earliest that security becomes a primal focus in the development life cycle. Because if you can get your requirements for the system to the point that it's understood through the, your developer and through your contract, then you don't have to bolt on security later on in the cycle. You'll have it more ingrained from the beginning. Uh, then you get into high level design, detailed design into your software hardware implementation. So, and then you go into actually getting it fully tested, builded, 
And even when it's filled, doing periodic updates, maintenance is all tied into the risk management framework where you're supposed to go through and do periodic analysis of the systems as they go through, which businesses should be always doing. You should always be analyzing and taking basically a health check of, of your systems through their life. And then when you retire a system, you should go through proper steps of making sure there's no invalid data going out, any proprietary data going out of your systems, anything that shouldn't be released out. You, you don't forget that when your systems are being end of life and being sent to recycling or being smelted or wherever your, your devices want to go to, however your companies decide to destroy your hardware. So key points to the NIST 800 series, there's about 175 documents in the series, cover a big range of subjects. The government implementation is a primary focus of the document, since it's made by a government agency, so it takes some time to, to read them. They're, they are somewhat tedious to go through and read if you've started going through any of them. But if you can start analyzing them and converting them into more your industry speak or into ways that your normal business processes go, it can help leverage ways that you can improve your processes. Uh, useful in developing or improving local policies and procedures. There's lots of lot policies and procedures basis to the NIST framework because it has about 18 different control families and usually the first part of each one is a policy and procedure in place on how you do certain things, what's your password policies, what how's your training policies, how do is other parts of the policies and procedures of your company, organization, and how do they go. So it's important to, to really focus on making sure everything is, is kind of documented and built up in your organization while you implement risk management. Yeah. This is way too. And they do continue to update the documents, and it's easy to look up, look overlook the key benefits within within the 800 series, especially in the 853 series. Uh, 800-53A Rev 4 is one that I deal a lot with in my work. It goes through, has over 600 different controls in there, and within there, there's over 2,000 sub-controls on how to implement and analyze and audit systems and security processes through the different families, domains of the risk management framework. Uh, the SP 800-171 is a new one that came out. It's mainly in DOD contractors for how they control unclassified information and being able to secure their systems. It's basically a subset of the overarching risk management framework that is out there, which would be a, a good starting point for a lot of businesses that they don't have any input or experience working with the risk management framework is to look in that one since it's very geared at protecting important information without releasing it out to general populations and give you an idea of how the controls are looked at and implemented. Uh, then there's the 114 Rev 1 goes into bring your own device security, gives some guidelines on how to implement that, things that you should look at if you're trying to implement a bring your own device policy at your organization. Uh, 1A3 is network of things or internet of things or network of networks, a whole bunch of different things on different key aspects of that type of technology that you should be looking at, how they communicate, how they process, and how they talk. And then dash 3 rev 1 is a guide in conducting risk assessments. And gives you an eye idea of how to go about doing risk assessments on systems, how you should set up your organizations to of what type of groups of people you should get involved in doing risk assessment. Okay. 
we get into how businesses can utilize risk management framework. And it's maybe lacking in securing different areas. This will help force that we need to, that your organization can help beef up their physical security aspects or their training aspects. And it gives you, it can give you some talking points that you can bring up to management or other aspects and help them understand that these areas also need to be looked at. Security isn't just in software or just in hardware. There, there's many other domains within security that organizations need to make sure they're aware of and looking after and not let any, which, any part go to the wayside. Which usually goes into that social engineering aspect and other things that sometimes is lacking in some organizations. Um, it's a good place to get a standard to judge current processes. Kind of gives you an idea of how the government's doing it and then how your organization compares if you you might be doing a lot better in other areas than what the guidelines say or you might be a little deficient in it. And then it can go into management into having them allocate resources right. We can choose your security team is big enough and has a proper background and experience to go through the stuff that they need to do. And also help enforce the, the program security through its life cycle. That you need to make sure that from contract, from inception, all the way to when you get rid of your item that your security is being looked at and being taken care of for your, for your equipment and your processes. So this gets into the control families. So access control is a big one. Making sure that people have the right rights for their systems to do their job, but not gain more rights than they, they aren't supposed to. Uh, awareness and training, audit and accountability is a big one. How do you keep your records? How long do you keep them? How often do you review them? Is all part of the audit part, audit section, and being able to control them and secure them and make sure that your audits aren't being leaked to people without the right rights. And then security assessment and authorization, configuration management is a big one, making sure that you keep, when you get new equipment, you itemize it, you, you part number it, you track it, right, and if there's any changes that groups do, they document their changes so you're aware that site X has a different configuration than site Y. Even though they initially started at the same configuration, if you don't have a good configuration management process or planning, then your sites can go out of sequence without a central repository knowing that you went a little, a little off of what it's supposed to be. Uh, incident response is a big one, making sure that you have plans for both physical and digital attacks, making sure that if weather or earthquakes outside of having site speed denial of service or whatnot. You have a backup plans and ways of mitigating your resources and moving it appropriately and not losing your uptime. Uh, maintenance is important. Be able to track that. Media protection, physical security environment protection is some that some places will usually forget to go about. They, they don't hurt their servers or or do their badges quite appropriately so you have more access to locations that you really need to. Uh, personnel security, making sure you have proper background checks and do your, your um, employment with your employees quite right so you're able to analyze the risk that your employees provide or are bringing into the environment. Uh, system service acquisitions gets into when the acquisitions of new equipment, making sure that it goes through good supply chains and not have rogue or malicious equipment get brought into the, your systems. 
system integrity and program management. So it covers a big wealth of knowledge and information throughout the RMF. And then they also get into FIP standards are used within the controls. So getting into FIPS 140-2, the crypto and everything else will be tied in, making sure that you use strong standards within your processes. So how it can help cons security is can be used by upper management to understand security risk. On the right, that's a risk management framework kind of circle, how it goes through. It goes with the engineering life cycle V that I showed earlier, but they made it into a circle and goes through. So you categorize your system. You kind of figure out what your system is, what does it do, what type of data it processes. If it uses PPI, does it have health? information, what, what type, is it proprietary information on your system? You kind of need to determine what that system is used for before you can progress. And then from that, you, you then go in and you can select the controls, select the security, what type of things you need to implement on the, to the system. And then that's basically your requirements part. Then you implement those requirements within it and you assess it and make sure basically you bring in a third party auditor and verify that the security was set up, your system is secure how you think it is. And then you authorize it to be used in your operational environment and then you monitor. You keep making sure that nothing's changed, nothing goes different than what is inspected within your usage of the equipment. All the way until you decommission it and you replace it with something new. And that goes all through. Um, as most managers, C-level will all understand risk. You can put your applications and everything else all into a risk format going, this is severe, this is benign type approach to, to securing your devices. It will help be able to give them an idea of how important different aspects of your security process and, and implementation is. It will also let you keep your resources better defined and not have groups get too big or too small for what their applicable needs. Okay. Um, and the metrics within the risk management framework are fairly easy to understand and convey. Uh, there's overlays within the 800-53 to simplify and kind of group the controls within it since there's so many. So as you go in, you can tailor different parts for different applications, different risk environments that you're going to implement and make the requirements a little bit easier to push on to your equipment and to your subcontractors or your your suppliers on what 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 you really need to mitigate the, the, the purpose of getting the equipment. Because you don't always need stuff for, that is more powerful or more complex than your security needs really require. You want something that you can manage and be appropriate to your, to your application. And as new technologies and new equipment comes about, the RMF will always they're planning to make it always develop and be lucid to, so it's always current to new technologies. So it's always good to go out and periodically update the information and, and review the documentation that you get from the NIST websites. And RMF can help organizations improve and standardize policies and procedures. You can start making things so all the different groups that run your physical security, your personnel can start having a similar language to talk and communicate with. And it 
security is more than just the digital realm. You have to be aware of, the, of security in all different ways and methods. Like it's over my main points. Uh, I'll show the my backup side. You can get the NIST documents from CSR c.nist.gov and that's where you can go out and that has all the documentations they're freely available to to grab and use and then I had a, a few of one's guide to secure web services PIV card readers and their interpretation guides there's a few key ones I have listed up above and to get into my question side while I do electronic badges I, I deal with risk the two big pictures are actually the front of a badge that we're working on where you can see we added extra board in one area so we can accommodate methods of carrying it well without mitigating its design and purpose so you risk is in all the different aspects of life and what you do with you might not always be thinking that it pertains with risk in different ways of meeting requirements and filling needs. And does anyone have any questions? No? Okay. Okay, so the question is, uh, organizations that don't really have defined policies or processes and they can't want to go through their normal way, how to kind of convert them into joining the group and getting into a normal policy and, and procedure method? Okay. It, it's tough. A lot of groups like to stay, they do it one way, they keep doing it one way, they don't like to change. It's really, you that's where the risk part comes in. You kind of have to show them that they're adding risk to the organization by not doing it way in a documented method. You kind of have to sometimes think out outside the box and give them examples that pertain to them, which can be hard to different groups. Where it, if you can show how an organization got manipulated or hacked because they were lacking a proper method of dealing with the circumstance that that helps push the point a little bit easier because then you have a, a an example risk to bring in and show or else you're just going in and, and just kind of showing them that this will improve your your way of work your way of life of going through when you document and have your policies and procedures out normal so everyone that any new hires anyone new can go in and understand the basis of the organization and start understanding your, your core role and your core security concerns while they eventually learn deeper into the process and how your the inner workings work. Does that work? Anyone else? Yeah.